Mm -hmm. So uh, Jean-Pierre Cabestan has come in uh, oh. with a question about the French sale of weapons to Taiwan and the possibility of uh, Chinese sanctions against France. Is there, would the EU be ready to support France in this, do you think? Oh, that's a really good question. I think that uh, you know, the one China policy is the EU position, but we've seen some really interesting developments because China, with their mass diplomacy, well, Taiwan has actually been extremely active in Europe, and they they approach it more in a European way. They're not asking for huge, you know, letters saying thank you for giving us these masks. So the the Taiwanese have had a public. Uh, very active public mask diplomacy. And it was so, uh, people in Europe were so grateful that the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, wrote a tweet to thank the Taiwanese for their great efforts. And now there's uh, talk of even the EU supporting Taiwan to be an observer at the WHO, which was actually something that they had before, uh, oh, or yeah, the WHA. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that was reversed after... Um, with the, the most recent election. So I think that uh, inadvertently, China is creating more positive feelings in Europe towards Taiwan. Uh, mm -hmm. The arms sale, we'll see. I, I, uh, I find that the commission, uh, the European institutions are extremely uh, fearful of upsetting China. So we, we call it uh, European sheep diplomacy. They're willing to self-censor, they're, they're very servile. So I. I suspect that that will be very difficult. We'll see how France um, plays that. Mm. You know, but, but do you think the EU will support France? That's the question. I don't think they can because you, yeah. have these, you have these countries that will not allow the EU to speak with one voice. So mm. we have in, other, in a, a statement, because that's what the EU does, it makes statements. You'll have a blocking country. You'll have either Hungary or Greece or all, you know, maybe even Italy now. So I, I, I don't suspect that you'll have any solid support from the EU. Well, let's turn to another topic, uh, because you mentioned earlier, and uh, Professor Jose Alvarez, um, uh, co-director now of the US Asia Law Institute, um, uh, says that uh, you, you, you talked about Sweden having paid a price um, for uh, its, uh, I seem to recall that this has to do with, uh, with Xinjiang and the, um, uh, Dissident in Xinjiang, yes, uh, who's, who's in Sweden, and um, and the, the the Chinese ambassador in Sweden, as you said, we have wine for friends and um, uh, something else, <laughs> a gun for our enemies, yeah. Yeah. So, so I guess the question is, what what are the prices? What what is the price that Sweden has has to has had to pay okay. here? That, that's a good Not question. And I, I, I realized when that came out of my mouth, I wish I hadn't said that, but um, oh. <laughs> Gui uh, Minhai, the uh, bookseller. Oh, Gui Minhai, um, yeah, Gui Minhai. Mm -hmm. He, uh, there has been a lot of um, fallout because that's we saw with, the, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. with the, the Swedish ambassador who yeah. some say she went rogue mm -hmm. and um, had this meeting with his daughter, who was a, stud a graduate student in London. So they had this secret mm -hmm. meeting mm -hmm. and some you know, wondered, what are they doing? How can you let the Swedish ambassador back and not know she's in the country having this, this meeting with his daughter, trying to ask her to be quiet, to not mm. talk about his situation. So I think that there was a lot of negativity. But on the other hand, we've seen Sweden uh, from, uh, they recently closed their last Confucius Institute. So they're, is growing uh, concern about China's influence in Sweden yeah. and having this kind of, I think Swedes are very proud of their ability as diplomats. And I feel, I think that they're a bit frustrated with the situation that they're in and the kind of wolf warrior diplomacy that Sweden has been uh, a victim or re on the receiving end of for you know several uh, weeks or months even. And that, um, you know, investments in strategic infrastructure is also being questioned in Sweden. So it's not as easy a, a ride because Sweden is one of those countries that didn't have uh, an FDI screening mechanism. And I think they're becoming far more proactive now mm. about the type of investment, especially in port infrastructure and things like that. So I think Sweden uh, has really changed uh, their approach with China. I mean, you're really drawing a picture of uh, a, a direct connection between politics and commercial engagement in, in, in the countries, right? You're seeing, I take it, you're seeing this broadly across the EU. And 
So the EU is what they would describe as a post-modern structure, mm -hmm. and that they, they, you know, they're, 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 these member states share sovereignty. But I think they're having some growing pains right now because what happens in a great power world? And in the past, we saw um, the head of the Asia Pacific Department was at an event at CSIS just prior to the announcement of the arbitral tribunal decision. And the EU said, we don't do geopolitics. So they didn't want to be asked. Yeah, but geopolitics might be doing you, so. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. can say, I don't do geopolitics, but geopolitics yeah. is very interested in Europe. Yeah. And so they, they always thought they could get like a free ride uh, and not have to make these difficult political decisions. So uh, there has been um, an evolution because for the first time ever, uh, the narrative used to be, we don't do geopolitics which is a handy excuse. So when you sell weapons, you don't have to think about the implications of that. But now with this new commission uh, under President Ursula von der Leyen, for the first time in history, they say, we are a geopolitical commission. So they are acknowledging, as, as Macron said, I think March 22nd, that we are no longer naive. So they see China really for what it is, going back to my M butterfly, they, instead of seeing it as a, how they wish it would be or how they would um, like to shape it, they, they acknowledge that it is this way and we have to be more of a realist. And I think that yeah. this is a big change in the way, uh, the lens that Europe is now looking at the world. It's difficult for them and you don't grow geopolitical muscles overnight. If you have a whole group of bureaucrats whose excuse over the last two decades has been, we don't do geopolitics as an excuse for you know, their, their positions, it's hard for them to change overnight and say, okay, now we have to take a geopolitical position. But also this geopolitical narrative was uh, acknowledged last year when they, uh, the commissioner for, uh, looked at what was happening in Central and Eastern Europe and said, we overestimated Russia and we underestimated China. So they weren't really looking at China as a, a power. And now they have to admit that whether they like it or not, China is a power within Europe and it can use its leverage to shape EU policy. So instead of the EU sh shaping China, China is really shaping the EU. Mm. Well, see, this is something I want to come back to, uh, this, this topic of you know, uh, geopolitics showing up on your doorstep, um, right? So one of the things that, that uh, way, and, and apart from pr previous conversations we've had, um, is that there really is a triangle going on, right? Um, it's China, the EU, and, and America, right? China, EU, America. So um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about your view of those geopolitics and sort of how Europe sees itself between the two? Uh, it's quite a, uh, an interesting time because in my life, I've never seen the US take such a negative approach. So the Trump administration has called Europe a foe. It sees uh, Europe, in, in some Trumpian terms, they said it was worse than China. So uh, this makes Brussels fearful and it puts the US, Russia and China all into the same basket. So this is kind of a, a worrisome trend, I would say. And so we've seen some transatlantic drift. And I would say that um, if you look at another institution that's less tainted by Chinese influence, it would be NATO. So you have the EU, which has been weakened by China's ability to block certain policies. And I suspect that there's very similar uh, ability at NATO, but because the US is involved in NATO, I think there's more recognition and, and NATO looks at the world through a strategic lens, which the EU wasn't used to doing. So we see, uh, a, so within this uh, strategic triangle, security is provided really by the US. Uh, the U.S., as far as I understand, even pays 75% of the NATO budget. The Trump administration has asked for an increase from Europe. And on the other hand, I, I, I describe it as Europe like to sit on the fence. So yeah. why not sit on the fence if you can get defense from the U.S. and then nice uh, economic trade deals with China? Great. And you don't have to choose. But I think uh, we saw prior to pre-COVID, uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, at the Munich Security Conference, Mike Pompeo made it pretty clear that the US was expecting Europe to choose. And so we see that also with Huawei decision. Um, President Trump was on the phone reportedly with Boris Johnson and made it clear that Huawei was not acceptable for, for them to stay in five eyes if 
the UK wanted to stay in this Five Eyes intelligence sharing uh, organization, they would not be able to embrace Huawei. So you see kind of more uh, tech techniques that the US has drawn some red lines in the relationship. So uh, I think traditionally, Europe, when they were unhappy uh, with the US, for example, after the, the, the Gulf War in 2003, they kind of turned to China and they saw China as you know, a possible uh, way for them to, to show more power by working together with China. Uh, the, the agenda um, that they have, the US has pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. So for Europeans, they see that, oh, the US doesn't agree with us on that, but China does. But in the reality, it's important to look at what China does, not just what they say or what they promise to do. Because we've seen with China's Belt and Road Initiative, we've seen an increase of, I saw a figure of 300 coal um, factories along, along the route. So some of this is also going to be in Europe's neighborhood in Central and Eastern Europe. So uh, this is a problem for them, even for the air that they breathe. So I think that uh, the notion that China is going to fulfill their promises for uh, Paris Climate Agreement really have fallen by the wayside. And we've even seen domestically now, China has issued um, uh, rules and regulations to allow more coal plants to be built inside China. So I think that they won't make the pledges that they agree to for the Paris climate. So Paris climate is one issue in transatlantic relations that causes friction and where China and Europe are on the same side. And I would also say the JCPOA, so the agreement with Iran. And uh, Europe felt very invested in that and felt that they had really helped create this agreement. And, um, and they were disappointed when Donald Trump pulled out of that. So those are two major issues where there's disagreement. And then lastly is the WTO. So Europe is hedging. So it has a group with uh, uh, Japan, US and Europe uh, for reforms within the WTO, but they also have Europe and China uh, working together for reforms with the WTO. So they're trying to really play both sides, but they're also upset with uh, the blocking of nominating um, judges. And so they've come up with this uh, other alternative route solution. So uh, just yesterday though, I saw a very promising note um, in the Financial Times, uh, Trade Commissioner Hogan has kind of, in my mind, uh, sent out uh, an olive branch to the Trump administration talking about how they can work together. There were three points. One of them was to come up with kind of a, a PPE, a personal uh, protective uh, gear sharing mechanism, like what happened with the oil embargo. So mm -hmm. to have an IEA for PPE, which I thought was very creative <laughs> and clever. Well, we're getting and, a lot of acronyms here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to, to have... Uh, kind of the International Energy Agency, which created a, a reserve of oil. So they, it would be a transatlantic project where they would have a reserve of uh, medical equipment. Mm. And uh, I thought this was a fantastic, uh, and it's, it's an, a European initiative. And mm. I thought this was a very positive issue. And they also talked about um, cooperation in the WTO. So yeah. these are really key uh, developments. And I hope that uh, Lighthizer will accept this olive branch and, and work together with the Europeans. Because at the end of the day, I know Europe is trying to be more geopolitical, but largely they're a trade body and they, the area that they're most successful in is their trade. So if the US is no longer seen as a country frightening them with tariffs and demands, and if they could actually work together and choose one problem at a time, they could uh, work together to help uh, prevent the type of economic coercion that I think China is actually starting to do now in Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this brings up a question that several people have been asking about. Um, Ira Belka, in, in particular, has asked: Is there any likelihood um, that the EU can come together to speak with one voice against, you know, against Chinese actions? They haven't been able to since 2016, and. Mm -hmm. uh, Former, uh, when he was in office, um, uh, President Juncker said, it is impossible for the EU to speak with one voice on China. So he admitted that. And even when they came up with this uh, statement, you know, that China is a systemic rival, uh, 
it was not this, this white paper. It was asked to be embraced by the council and the council did not embrace it. So most journalists just said, oh, Europe is getting tough on China. But mm. the reality was that the council could not agree among themselves. And I suspect, you know, the usual um, culprits were blocking it. So the, it was never uh, uh, supported by the council. So the, there is a change in uh, language the EU is unable to speak with one voice on China. So what we've seen now, sometimes you might have heard about these uh, European ships in the South China Sea doing a uh, freedom uh, phone op, uh, right. freedom uh, navigation yeah. operation. And China is very keen to say that this is not an EU ship. It's not an EU thing, even though they'll have like a symbolic person from the EU institution on the ship and other European researchers it's we call it very because of this blocking that china is able to do we call it a very variable geometry so it's kind of coalitions of the willing mm -hmm. uh, eu member states willing to work together on specific projects like that to send a signal but it's not really the eu so it, it works you know it does send an important message but it's not really an eu project though all, it's a variable geometry and it's the only workaround because right. of the blocking that china has able to do yeah you know um it, it does remind me a lot of of china's influence within asean um you know the the development of the 17 plus one um sort of eastern european system um uh, really competes with the EU as, as a whole, right? It's a very interesting, interesting development. So one of the questions that, that I've got um, while we're on this, you know, uh, sort of geopolitical uh, aspect of our conversation is what, what is this, um, what does it mean that, that, that the Chinese are calling, I mean, that the EU is calling China a systemic rival. I mean, we know that there's great power competition uh, from the American perspective. We know that the Europeans are postmodern, as you put it. Um, uh, and so what is it that they are, what does it mean that they're referring to um, China as a systemic rival? So they see it in terms of framing it in terms of values. So it's a threat to their value system, the way they see the world, because uh, even though the commission describes itself as geopolitical, there's a real reluctance to talk about a G2 world mm. because that leaves Europe on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying there's great power rivalry, which is anathema to them, I, I, there are some contradictions, I agree. And I think that there are tensions and contradictions, but the Europeans like to talk about it's a systemic rival that China's um, Chinese Communist Party system uh, an economic system promoting state-owned enterprises is actually a, a threat to their way of life and their values. So I think that um, that's how they prefer to frame it. They don't like to discuss uh, great power rivalry. So um, uh, what, I guess I guess I've got a number of different questions um, related to this, but um, why is it that? that the uh, 17 plus one is so is such an important um, sort of drive. Why, why would China even attempt to create that kind of organization other than to sort of split apart the EU? I, I think, uh, well, we, as we know, Mackinder, uh, ah. uh, the, the, the strategist Mackinder said, whoever controls Central and Eastern Europe, uh, oh, you, you know the quote better than me. I'm sorry, I have it. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, I think I know you're referring to um, uh, the country that uh, he who controls Eastern Europe controls uh, the world island, I think is what it is. And then, um, and then uh, whoever controls the world island controls the world. In other words, um, geo strategists have long seen Eastern Europe um, as sort of a very important uh, uh, you know, piece of, uh, of geopolitical uh, territory. And um, and so it's very interesting, right? So that, that number one, China's um, made Eastern Europe the sort of endpoint for a lot of the, the land component of BRI, which by the way, I do want to come back to here in a second. Um, but I and, think that uh, right, so, 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 you know, we don't know exactly what the Chinese are, are trying to do other than to, to, you know, we can presume that they're trying to divide the EU, but it does seem like a, a sort of a power dynamic at play here uh, where the Chinese are really engaging broadly in the Eurasian continent with uh, with the power dynamics, not just economic engagement. 
because the Chinese narrative is that we want to help the accession states be better and that they can join the EU. But the reality is we're seeing that, for example, Serbia is getting pulled further and further out of the European orbit. And, uh, you know, they're having Huawei smart cities and, you know, uh, Chinese uh, advisors, Chinese police are on the ground in Serbia. So it's nice to have multiple partners, but if it kind of uh, distracts you from your real agenda, but the public wants to join the EU, uh, this might you know, have serious ramifications for the political system there. But also, if you think about it, I mean, it's really brilliant. So it's, uh, um, uh, it's a new land sea corridor. So we had the 16 plus one and last year Greece was added to it. So you have the opening with the Piraeus port. So you have 16 now it's 17 plus one and the joke in Brussels that soon it will be 27 plus one. So, China, <laughs> so the rest of Europe will eventually join. Maybe Italy will be the next one. So this kind of sub-regional grouping that um, we've even seen with COVID-19 uh, that they had special 17 plus one uh, Zoom, not, they, it wasn't Zoom, but they had special online conferences talking about China's best practices in dealing with COVID-19. So they, they even used the pandemic as a way to kind of bring the 17 plus one closer. And I had this fantastic experience back at the end of August. I was invited to the Bled Strategic Forum in Slovenia. And I, I, I noticed at this really early morning event, I think it was like at 8 a.m., it was security in the Mediterranean, that was a subject. And I, I, I'm very interested in that. And I went and I, I was amazed that about 80% of the people sitting in this early morning meeting were Chinese. And so during the coffee break, I was like, whoa, you know, I, I'm so surprised to see the, such great interest in security in the Mediterranean. And they told me that they were there for a conference that was going to be on the sidelines. And I, they showed me on their phone what the conference was about. They showed me the agenda and it was a 17 plus one think tank conference. And I said, oh, I'm, I'm with a think tank and based in Brussels, I would really, really love to attend. So they're being very hospitable, very kind, and they let me attend. So I think I'm the first person who was not a member of the 17 plus one. And I just went and took notes and was quiet. And you could see, <laughs> <laughs> you could see uh, how they, uh, it wasn't necessarily what the pres presenters were saying, but my, my, personal observation was that they were seeing how the other member states were interacting with each other and how they talked about Brussels. And I think that this is really useful for them. And the two people who were running this event were extremely impressive because they are part of that, you know, legendary first class of people who went to college abroad after the Cultural Revolution. So there was one male and one female, and they were both from this legendary class. And the, um, the woman was sent to study Tito's reforms in Yugoslavia. So she had such a depth of knowledge of that region. And the other was an expert on Poland, spoke Polish, had you know, a great deal of experience in the region. So that kind of depth of knowledge and experience, I don't think any other country can replicate. Mm -hmm. So they really had you know, some sharp people there. Um, and this, uh, you know, we see not just Hungary, we also see, you know, uh, liberal democracy under pressure inside Poland as well. Mm -hmm. So these are countries that had kind of shallower roots in democracy. And now we're seeing them kind of veering away from uh, EU uh, norms and rules and uh, a key, the, the rules and regulations of, of Europe. So I think that this is something of great concern for Europe. And if you look at the map, so you go from uh, Piraeus port on the Mediterranean all the way up to the Baltic. So this is a key land sea corridor that China yeah. Yeah. amazingly has now. And uh, I find it absolutely incredible. And you know, they did it incrementally, slowly, step by step, but now look what they have. And during this pandemic, we saw um, the Brussels had, was able to block the, the rail deal between Hungary and Serbia because of the procurement procedure. Hungary didn't uh, follow the correct rules and regulations for the procurement. So it was like a, a closed bid. But Serbia, which is not an EU member state, you know, China got the bid, obviously. And they were building the rail in Serbia, but it was effectively blocked and Hungary was unable to build it. Now, mm -hmm. because of the COVID-19 uh, emergency measures taken in Hungary, Hungary signed the paper, they're building the railway, and no one can look at the documents for 10 years. Oh, wow. So they kind of broke the rules in order to get this railway built. Mm 
So even during the pandemic, China is moving, advancing their agenda in the region. So this was a big shock to people in Brussels. That's fascinating. Is China building the, the Hungarian portion of the railroad yes. too? Yes. Now, now they've got the go-ahead from the emergency measures that Orban has imposed because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of questions related to kind of a dynamic, right? The, there is in Europe a certain uh, anti-Americanism that sort of rises and falls at various times, um, at sometimes dependent on administrations, and we'll just leave it at that. Um, and, uh, and, and there's also sort of, you know, anti-Russia, anti-China, anti-EU even, right? So up and down sort of these things. Um, and so there's a lot of questions that some of them revolve around Italy, right? So what, what's sort of the, your perception? I know, I know your family is, um, is at least part Italian, right? So your, uh, your husband and children uh, have Italian names, so I'm assuming. Uh, but, uh, but I also, um, uh, I mean, Italy's kind of an interesting barometer of, of so much change, right? So um, how, do you, how do you see that? Uh, what's actually going on in terms of the, uh, maybe the popularity contest, what we're talking right. about. Well, Italy uh, was, in 2019, they were the first G7 country to sign up for the Belt and Road Initiative. So for a, a rather bleak year on China's Belt and Road prog program, especially since they were going to be hosting the second Belt and Road Forum, it was a big win to get Italy to sign on. So that was you know, heralded as a huge success story. And I think there was a lot of pushback um, uh, concerns about, you know, Huawei and, uh, you know, there are a lot of NATO ports in, in Italy. It's a key country on the Mediterranean. And I think there was a great deal of concern because it's one of the leading economies also in Europe. And under this current administration, the man who signed uh, the BRI agreement, um, uh, Luigi Di Maio, was kind of willing to kind of turn, to, turn a blind eye when China was um, conflating aid with uh, customers. So the, the Italian Red Cross was receiving uh, equipment and uh, personal protective equipment from China through the Red Cross channel. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of seen uh, publicly that it was China giving aid to Italy. And Luigi Di Maio, to show that he was making the right choice by signing up for the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, kind of turned a blind eye and allowed this narrative to, to go on. Uh, Italy never made a statement when China said that uh, Italy was a place where COVID-19 began. Um, there was no statement made about that. And I think that um, there are, it's a, the government has to show the public that yes, we're, we're doing a great thing by working with, with China. We also saw Russia not letting China have the whole stage to themselves. So several days later, Russia flew in uh, aid uh, from cool. Russia to love and had military trucks go land in Rome to, so they could have that amazing footage of Russian military trucks in Italy driving north to uh, Bergamo, where, where was the epicenter of the, yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. So uh, I, I know it was a small, um, uh, they did a survey, it was a small sample group, but it was pretty shocking. Uh, so how uh, China was perceived as a friend, like Amici, so 53%. Um, followed by Russia, and then the U.S. was down to 17%. Mm. And then Germany, and then Nemici, so enemies. So it was uh, Germany was seen as an enemy wow. and France. And so this also feeds Euroscepticism. And I know, you know, people in Milan for many, many years, uh, for like the 25 years, and middle-class people who were always supporters of the EU, and the way the system has played out, the kind of um, the missteps that the EU took in the early days, in the initial days of the um, pandemic, there is a great anger among the public about how they feel that they were abandoned by Brussels and that um, there's real anger towards that. So I'm, I'm afraid where Italy is going to position itself and there seems to be growing Euroscepticism in Italy. So it's not just EU-China relations. We see EU having a lot of existential crises with mm -hmm. the demise of democracy in some countries in Central Eastern Europe and with the economic uh, crisis that is uh, going to follow this pandemic it will fuel nationalism and therefore most likely more Euroscepticism.
Well, this is really interesting uh, for an entity, the EU, that sees itself as postmodern, right? You see Europe itself sort of becoming more sovereignty oriented, right? In, in its response to COVID-19 was very much national as opposed to transnational. Um, I know both Italy and Serbia, you know, were, you know, left out of the cold. At least that's how they felt. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it wasn't Europe's finest hour. They did, you know, manage to, to perform much better afterwards, but the initial stage, they were very missing in action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, there's a question that's uh, really kind of interesting. Uh, Alvin Chang, a, a, a um, U.S. Asia Law Institute fellow um, and graduate of uh, NYU Law School, um, asks about um, the bureaucratic culture of the EU Commission, right? So this sort of investment in the EU and then this um, sort of yes minister uh, approach. In other words, just sort of, well, <laughs> so, so um, the dynamic there is what I think he's interested in. I'm, I wonder if you can comment about that. Okay, I think, I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. And I know, you know, Europe is trying to formulate a foreign policy and they, you know, want to have all the accoutrements of, you know, major power. But I think that this is the problem. This is really where they fall down is in foreign policy formulation. And we see, you know, with 27 member states and then the, the head of the delegation just deciding to, you know, self-censor. It, it doesn't, a bureaucracy that, to rise in this type of bureaucracy, you, you need to be servile. And so it doesn't go hand in hand with good foreign policy making. So I think that there is a bit of a contradiction there, sorry to say, because I, I, I went to the London School of Economics before, you know, many years ago when I was very much a believer in the European uh, dream. And I, I'm sorry to see the UK leave, but I also see there are a great deal of tensions and um, a, a need for a reality check. So I think what happened with Italy you know, they couldn't get masks. And can you think that those people are going to trust that EU institutions are going to save them in a military situation? So I think that the, these ideas of PESCO and these um, autonomous European security arrangements. I'm not familiar with, with PESCO. Okay. Um, permanent, oh gosh, uh, I should know this. Um, it, it's, it's a well, just describe it it's okay yeah. okay it's it's a, a configuration of you know there's this feeling that the u.s uh or as as macron um uh, macron has said nato is brain dead so there's this kind of dissatisfaction <laughs> with nato among some eu member states but this is also a very deeply divisive issue because it depends where you are in europe so if you're france you have a very different view than say if you're a baltic country looking at at russia and um, and the fact that when Macron had talked about this other, uh, an additional grouping of countries to have European autonomy and to have security relations, it, it kept Poland out of it. And so you already saw these divisions within Europe and a lack of trust. And really this idea of um, defense autonomy was dividing Europe even further, in my view, from watching and observing various member states. So it sounded really good on paper, but if I was Italy and I couldn't get a mask from the rest of the EU, I would be very uh, skeptical of them offering me security uh, in case I was attacked. So I think that with the economic restrictions that are bound to happen after this pandemic, uh, there will be a, a strengthening, or what I would ideally like to see, a strengthening of the European um, uh, pillar within NATO. And I think NATO is a good place for them to, to be because we've seen even with European studies by issued by the European uh, think tank, they are not spending money on, you know, so it, there, there's not going to be much money. After all these years, uh, there's really under investment in defense. And I think not to replicate or to duplicate it's better to strengthen a European um, column within NATO. I think that that would be the best way to move forward. So um, can we turn for a minute, thank you for that, Teresa. Can we turn for a minute uh, back to uh, questions regarding human rights? There's just, to my mind, there's just, uh, it's really rather astonishing uh, that uh, over and over again, you know, uh, liberal rules-based order Europeans um, 
uh, seem to be ineffective in um, defending these, these interests. Um, I, I heard a really terrific presentation at the Council on Foreign Relations just recently in which um, the American ambassador for human rights to the UN um, uh, talked about why the US withdrew from the Human Rights Council. And, and basically, she, um, um, I, I, I guess it's probably a Chatham House uh, talk, so I, I guess I can't say what exactly she said. But, but I know it is American, you know, frust American frustration Right with Europeans who, uh, you know, at least in the UN, sometimes were, you know, hiding behind American um, criticism of China and human rights issues. Um, but then once you know the United States says, "Fine, we're not going to do this anymore," um, you know, the Europeans are not necessarily stepping forward and having to to carry the water themselves. This is really surprising, frankly. Um, and Jerry Cohen actually comes in with a question about this issue, right? Which is. Um, uh, so, so to what degree is the, you know, is the EU itself, right, the EU as an organization taking advantage um, of, of some of the, the resources available within Europe uh, largely? You know, we have quite a lot of um, sort of relationships. The U.S. Asia Law Institute has quite a lot of relationships with scholars in Europe working on these. Um, you might know Eva Pills, for instance. You might know uh, Benjamin Van Roy. You might know um, uh, Li Ling in Vienna, for instance. So. Um, there are lots of resources there. Are they drawing on them? What do you think? Well, that, that's a very good question. And hello, Jerry. Uh, I remember meeting him for the very first time when I was based in Beijing. I'm so excited that he spoke at uh, the Foreign Correspondence Club. Uh, I think that, um, all right, at the EU level, it's always the, the lowest common denominator of 27 countries. So it's not going to be very uh, active and vocal. But we saw, I even saw something written yesterday um, because Germany was to host this big event in Leipzig uh, in September where all 27 EU member states and Xi Jinping would meet. And it was supposed to be the crowning event of uh, Angela Merkel's uh, chancellorship. So there were great, I, you know, this was supposed to be a very symbolic and important meeting about EU-China relations. Now, because of COVID-19, this has been kind of mothballed, but I've seen, no one knows if it will happen live or if it will be virtual, but I've seen German writers saying, we must bring up human rights at this event. We must uh, mm -hmm. promote it. So you have these individual voices outside of government who feel very strongly and are very motivated. So they are voices within the system, whether they're heard or not, or if they're loud enough remains to be seen. So I, I would say that it's, um, it used to be, we called it the, the silver thread through all EU directives. Human rights was very, very important, but we've seen that watered down now and uh, it's, it's not brought up and it's, it's, a, it's a success story for China that EU member states are afraid to even talk about it. So I think this type of self-censorship is, is uh, very disappointing and discouraging. Mm. So um, I want to move for a minute uh, to the question of trade and trade agreements, um, if you don't mind. And there's been a couple of questions related to this. So, for instance, uh, you know, I think the EU and, and China uh, are, are working on a, a, a bilateral investment uh, treaty. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, maybe you could comment on, on the progress of that and, you know, whether some of these... Um, I don't know if you can if you can solve all these problems in a in, in a bilateral investment treaty, but uh, whether some of the problems related to CPS, whether some of the problems related to um, tech transfer and et cetera, um, are, you know, can be resolved through some of these processes. Well, this is the uh, conundrum for Europe because they want to see progress on the uh, bilateral investment treaty, the BIT. And I was I attended Wang Yi's talk. Uh, it was last December. He came to. Uh, Brussels. And of course, he got a question about uh, the bit uh, negotiations. And he said, very calmly, China is a developing economy. Therefore, we cannot have <laughs> this type of agreement. So I just thought, oh my goodness, the EU is so geared up for mm -hmm. this BIT and it's kind of watermark uh, for success. And they, they want to see movement on this. This was also highlighted in the EU uh, statement prior to the EU-China meeting uh, last April, but we're seeing that you know, the, the Chinese position at the highest level is saying that they are a developing economy, so therefore we can't have a bilateral investment treaty. So immediately the, the alarm bell went off in my brain, and I, I think there's a lot of talk 
they've been dragging their heels on this for over six or seven years now. And I, I don't suspect that there will be any, uh, I don't like to make predictions, but I don't expect any progress on that at all. Mm. And, and the Chinese narrative, the, the Beijing's narrative is that, oh, we can't work on it because, you know, we've been so busy with uh, the pandemic. So, you know, there's, uh, I don't really see any great movement. And in a bureaucracy, you always want to have, you know, benchmarks and, and show that you're moving ahead. But I, I really, I don't expect it to get off the ground. So um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you in a few minutes, uh, we have a few more questions I want to get to, but I'm going to ask you in a few minutes to, uh, to sort of give some closing thoughts about sort of, um, no, 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 just sort of where you think, you know, the future will go. Like what, what, what are, what's going to be your, your thought about the future? Um, but before that, uh, while you're while you're thinking about that, uh, we, we'll also put to you uh, a couple of other questions. One of which is, I think, is a is, is a, a pretty intriguing question, which has to do with um, you know we've talked about the geopolitics, right, with Europe at the center and sort of U.S. and China, and, and, and to some degree Russia, um, sort of around it. Uh, we've also talked about some of the, the weaknesses of the of the EU model um, in being able to sort of deal with this um, this sort of geopolitical uh, reality that we live in. But uh, the question has to do with um, what might there be some strengths to this model? Are there some strengths actually um, to the EU model that um, that could be leveraged in a way to act on the world stage uh, in ways that the US cannot? Um, I think that's a terrific question. It's by uh, Seth Gerbel. It's by who? Um, I don't know this uh, oh, person, okay. but his name is Seth Ger uh, G U R G E L. It's Gerbel or Virgil? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't want to come across so pessimistic about the EU because I, I'm very critical of it because I believe in it and I, I want to see it improve itself and right, fine right. tune itself. Um, I think that the clear weakness is that they're unable to speak with one voice on China. If you can get, and they must, you know, if they really want to have any leverage over China, they need to all pull together and, and speak with one voice. Uh, they need good leadership to, to pull that off. All right. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, kind of came in with this, you know, very difficult agenda, especially early on in her presidency uh, with the pandemic. There have been many, many issues. This has been a, they're working on green. They wanted to have a green agenda. That was mm. the original priorities before the pandemic. So everything has to respond to, you know, the, the current situation on the ground. What can the EU offer? I think that I was also disappointed. I understand, you know, that um, in Europe, you know, there is, as you mentioned earlier, to pick up on that point about anti-Americanism and with the Trump administration and the frictions in the transatlantic alliance at that time, I was really hoping to see the EU pick up the ball and, and use this time to really step up onto the international stage and, and be more active. And we haven't seen that. We've seen their absence. And uh, it's easy for the EU to sit back and criticize the US, but then at the end of the day, what are they doing? You know, mm -hmm. If you sit constantly criticizing and not really supplying things, uh, public, international public goods, um, preserving international rules and norms, I think that this is a problem. So we, we've seen a slow erosion of European values and norms, and I think that that's a problem. So what, uh, trying to be positive, um, what can Europe bring to the international stage? Um, I think that their ability, you know, if they can speak together with one voice, and we, we also see this interesting, um, middle power movement going on because there are concerns about the US and you have other countries in Asia. So you, you see the EU and Japan, this is a positive story. Um, in response to China's Belt and Road Initiative, last year, Japan and the EU got together to do their own connectivity and with higher quality and high levels and you know in regard to the environment. So I think that uh, that was a good initiative and that was under um, uh, Abe and uh, Juncker. So they have this connectivity strategy between Europe and Asia, but with higher, to, to compete kind of with China. Obviously, they don't have as deep pockets as China, but it offers an alternative. So they can actually look at deals and say, hey, this contract isn't so good. So some really grassroots things, but which actually show countries they have other opportunities. They don't have to just turn to China. So I think that this was a positive 
uh, development. And I would hope to see that bet go further. We also see Europe is very active with free trade agreements. Mm. Uh, they have one with South Korea, with Japan. So we see Europe actually being a normative power and shaping uh, a lot of these agreements. And then when the US comes in later, these, these will already be established facts on the ground. Yeah, this, I, I have to tell you, Teresa, I've always thought that, that Europe's real, um, <laughs> so, so it's superpower, right? So, so uh, um, Europe's real superpower in a sense is, is it's the voice of conscience in, in a sense, right? It's, it's, it's this, um, you know, the horrible experiences of World War II and of the Holocaust and all, all of the, the, just the horrors, right? That Europe went through in the first half of the, of, of the uh, 20th century um, leaves Europe in a, in a particular place, it seems to me, to, to speak with a, a voice of authority about you know sort of the never again and here's here's not only here's why but here's how right and uh, and so it seems to me uh, it really disappoints me I'll say that um, that Europe has had a hard time finding its voice in that regard um, you know because right now with you know with with the issues that we're seeing in, in Hong Kong the issues that we're seeing in Xinjiang the long-standing issues in Tibet the the um, you know the Guaymin Hai case you talked about earlier, the the the, um, the lawyers in China that are being uh, rounded up and and um, you know all sorts of course of pressure are being uh, uh, put on human rights lawyers and you know we're 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 in a particular moment where this voice of conscience I think it seems to me um, is is really needed on on the world stage and so um, so anyway that's that's sort of my my um, my last thought about uh, you know. The, the, the shame that not shame the, the pity that it is that um, you know liberalism is not being more av uh, avidly supported uh, by, by by Europe right now especially when it's also under attack you know from, from the American uh, perspective right now which which also saddens me very much um, so I told you I was going to give you the closing you know the last last couple of minutes we we only have two or three minutes uh, but um, I do want to know kind of your you know, what do you see for the future? Where, you know, where do you see China and Europe uh, headed? I'm worried about China's uh, economic coercion in the region. And we see, you know, there's always a bit of a lag time. The U.S. Is, uh, has CFIUS, so Europe slowly has this kind of foreign direct uh, screening mechanism. We also see this concern in the U.S. about like the Thousand Talents program. But mm. Europe doesn't even, there's a very low awareness about um, this type of, so as it gets more and more difficult for China to buy technology from the U.S., obviously they're going to be cultivating uh, professors, experts in Europe for the same technology. And I don't. I think there's a very low uh, threshold uh, of understanding on that. And I think that this could also complicate um, transatlantic relations if Europe is considered to be uh, supplying this type of technology to to China. So I think that there are calls for uh, an evolution in how things are screened, not just businesses, but also these types of relationships with universities and technical institutes. So there seems to be a growing, a slow but growing awareness uh, across Europe. I think the Huawei debate is gonna be really rough. And I think that that will be a huge barometer of EU, uh, US, China on the strategic triangle, how that plays out. And we've already seen you know, Germany, as I, I mentioned earlier, facts on the ground, they're, they're building this up. And um, I have concerns because as a member of NATO, the countries have to have a secure communication system. So someone very calmly said to me at NATO, well, I hope the Germans factor into the equation how much it will cost them to come up with a second uh, <laughs> communication system so that they can safely communicate with NATO. That is required if you have membership. So I think the debate is, is ongoing, but I think that um, Huawei has been, you know, very sophisticated in their approach uh, across Europe. So it will be difficult for some countries to say no. And, uh, and I think that you brought up a really clear point, you know, the voice of conscience. Uh, we just had Europe Day, um, the anniversary of, for Europe uh, on the 9th of March. And I think that this lesson as people age and, and uh, people who have living memory of the war uh, are becoming more you know, not with us any longer. I think it, it's hard for people to really understand 
I think, especially the younger generation, they take a lot of these things for granted. I think they take peace for granted. I think they take all of these uh, special arrangements for granted. And uh, I think that there's a problem with that. Uh, teaching history, uh, because of my, my, my children, I realize how their history was taught to them. And it's very problematic. It's very uh, difficult to do. Uh, and lastly, um, I was at a conference in Germany and we have a, a museum in Brussels called the Museum of Europe. And they have this whole section on um, the Cold War and, and propaganda from that period. And when I was at this conference in Berlin, I was like, oh my gosh, this looks just like a Cold War poster, but it was, had um, a vise and on one side was the American flag and on the other was the Chinese flag. And in the middle was German industry, like a woman holding you know, a plane and a train. Oh and it was just like an echo of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm concerned about this growing narrative. I don't really think it will be a Cold War. I, don't, I think it's unchartered territory. I think the Chinese have studied the Soviet model very carefully. And you had ComCon, you had this kind of uh, internal Soviet uh, economy, whereas China is everywhere. So oh. I think to have a Cold War narrative would be China very, very is everywhere. That's exactly <laughs> right. It's a good note to end on, too. Um, Teresa, thank you so much for a brilliant job today. I really appreciate the conversation. It was just wonderful. Um, and, and I want to tell all the, you know, all the attendees out there, too, uh, to be sure to check the uh, USALI, USALI.org uh, website for future events, including our conversation next week with Sam Sachs. That's a week from Friday, May 22nd, uh, during which we'll be exploring the politics of data and U.S.-China competition. Well. Again, thank you very much, Teresa. Brilliant job. Thank you, Peter. It was really an honor. All right, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll conclude our program at this point. And uh, Teresa, if you'll wait just one moment, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let uh, Alexis end the program. Okay. okay. And I, I'm gonna stop the recording if I can. Okay. I don't know that I can.